I've got my rock. Here we go. Hey, if you've got your Bible or your Bible app, turn to Lamentations this morning. A little pick-me-up in the saddest, most depressing book in the Bible this morning is where we find ourselves, Lamentations. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, It is good to be here with you. Jesus has led us on mission literally around the world and and back again. Uh, I'm from California originally, but very excited to see what God is doing here amongst the Jessup family and very excited to be a part of the family here. So thank you for adopting us and welcoming us into your your home, into your space. And uh, we are so stoked to be here. Um, As Ryan mentioned, I have uh, three little hobbits of my own. Uh, They are six, eight, and 10, and we are shamelessly now plugging uh, for babysitters. Um, And uh, they are awesome. They don't have hairy feet, uh, at least not that I noticed. I have two boys, Noah and Corbin, and my daughter's name is Hope. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, Hope Under Construction. And so... In order to do that, we are going to go to the saddest, most depressing book in the Bible. Lamentations chapter 3. Jeremiah speaking. I am a man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven me and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He has bent his bow and set me as the target for his arrow. He has drove into my kidneys the arrow of his quiver, and I have become the laughing stock of all the peoples, the objects of all their taunts. All day long, he has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. Who's encouraged so far this morning? He has made my teeth grind on gravel. He has made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. And so I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. That's the low point. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, you are the God of all hope. As we sang this morning that you are the rock, you are the firm foundation, you are the never changing one. While nothing in this life is constant or guaranteed or assured, Jesus, your life, death, and resurrection is. And you are now seated at the right hand of the Father, as Hebrews says, interceding for us, literally talking to God about us, about Jessup, about the things that concern us and break us and destroy us and kick us in the head. All of our drama and issues and all of those things God, we take those to you right now, and we ask, Lord, that you would speak through your word by the power of your spirit. God, that I would just get out of the way, and that, Jesus, you would do business with the hearts of your family, your church here this morning. Lord, we come expectant, and Lord, we pray that you would have all the glory and honor and praise in this place. In your name, Jesus, amen. Life is messy. It either has been, is, or will be. July 6th, 16th, 2006 was a very messy day for our family. Up until this point, we were a pretty nuclear family. Not much had taken place in our lives. Sure, we had our fair share of hardships and difficulties and those things. But nothing really 
was earth-shattering or monumentous in us in terms of uh, anything like what we were going to experience on that day. On that day, I was conducting a, a wedding for some of our best friends down in Southern California, and immediately after that wedding, my brother pulled me aside and he said, Mom and Dad have just had a fire. They've lost everything, but they're alive. And I said, what? I thought he was joking. And he said, I think we're going to need to go up and be with him. On that day, a drunk woman burned down my parents' house. They lived in Placerville, and they still do. Some of you know where that is. I'm so happy to be in a place where people know where Placerville is. <laughs> Not many people in New Zealand know where that place is. It's a special place. There was a, there was a woman who was leaving a bar at 4 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. The temperatures were soaring above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The grass was about this tall and perfectly dead. She was driving drunk and was in a hit and run accident with a motorcyclist. She killed this man instantly. He had retired six months before and was riding on his Harley Davidson that he had as his own retirement gift. He left behind a wife, he left behind kids and grandkids. Of course, being drunk and already your, your judgment is impaired, she decided to flee the scene. And what she didn't realize is that she had no longer four tires on her vehicle, but three tires on her vehicle. And she proceeded to run about eight to ten miles before the cops could catch her, starting wildfires on the rim of her wheel without the tire. One of those fires burnt down my parents' home. This is a picture of us. Um, here, that's my brother on the far uh, left, he's the big guy, and then my parents in the middle, and that's what's left of the home that I grew up in. It's the home that I remember. I can still go back in my mind's eye and hear every creak, every door, every memory in that place. And in a moment, it was reduced to rubble. In a very second, if you don't understand fire in a physical sense, it moves fast. And if you think about fire, you think about it just coming along the ground, it doesn't. It comes in a storm. It comes from above. It comes at you. It comes from below. It literally creates its own weather and destroys everything in its way. Jeremiah was a man acquainted with grief. For 40 years he had been faithful to God, and not once do we read in his account with the title of the book by his own name that anybody responds to his message. The message was, get right with God. The message was, stop what you're doing, turn, repent, and face him. And not once do we read about anybody turning to him. Lamentations follows the book of Jeremiah, and it's a funeral dirge. I know it's an interesting message to bring to chapel. I was given the opportunity to speak on anything. But I think what we need is hope. Because here's the question I have. How do you find the real thing? I mean, when everything else has been taken away, what do you have left? Because everything can be taken away except for some things, and those are the things I want to talk about. When we left for New Zealand almost six and a half, seven years ago, there was somebody campaigning, a, a little-known politician at the time by the name of Barack Obama. And on his first campaign, he campaigned and won on one word. Do you remember what it was? Hope. Why? Because we're so desperate for it. We want the real thing. But people come and go. Promises are made and some promises are kept. But here's the thing. I want to know in the midst of life's messiness, what are those things that can't be taken away? And in the midst of the most depressing book in the Bible, one of the darkest places in the life of Jeremiah and in the history of Israel, we find hope because light shines brightest in the dark. That's why we turn here. And we see in verse 21, there's a mental shift that takes place. I'm curious what in the thinking of Jeremiah shifts here that has him recall and therefore have hope. He says, I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Ian McLaren, a great Scottish preacher from the 19th century, said, Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. The person across the hall from you is fighting a hard battle. Your parents on the phone are fighting their own battle. The people you stand in line with at Costco are fighting battles. 
You don't even know the battles that are going on in the person sitting behind you and in front of you right now in this place. Part of my role here at Jessup is student care, and I've already met with students that are battling hard fights. And you know what I want to tell them? I want to tell them that Jesus died for days like today. When you have lost everything and everything is burnt down to the ground, Jesus died for that. But I'm here to tell you that on the third day he rose again. Amen? I had a little walk out into the field just behind Jessup here because some of it burnt down. And I figured it was this obligatory thing if you're going to speak in chapel to bring a rock. So I grabbed this rock. It survived the fire. <laughs> the little photo on the screen here um, at the bottom there is a photo I took of the actual field out behind here. But Jeremiah would have been overlooking the smoldering ruins of Jerusalem, riding this funeral dirge. And yet something in his headspace shifts. He says, I'm going to call to mind everything that I've lost and everything that I have in Christ. The Hebrew word for hope is yachel. So you guys are all Bible scholars, at least Bible minors, right? So I want you to say that word with me. Yachel. Can you say that? Yachel. I mean... Like a, like a real Hebrew, like guttural, back of your throat, yachel, yachel. Okay, now just wipe the back of the head in front of you. <laughs> that word means an eager expectation of good to come. It's an eager expectation of something that isn't quite yet, but you are hopeful and faithful that something good is coming. Something good is coming. Besides having an incredible last name, an Italian last name, Louis Zampernini has a most amazing story. And one of the best books I've read in the last five years called Unbroken, Laura Hillebrand in her book recounts the story of Louis's life. He began as a juvenile delinquent, stealing, robbing, getting into all sorts of trouble. And the other thing that you notice about this boy is that he's incredibly fast, which those two go in hand in hand when you're stealing stuff and you're quick. <laughs> That seems to work out. Thankfully, he had an older brother that took his speed and brought it to the track and field arena. He ended up making the Olympic team. And I don't want to give away the whole story, but he ended up shaking Hitler's hands at the Munich Games. World War II came along, and he went into the uh, military, into the army. That for, at that point, it was before the Air Force, but he was flying over the Pacific, shot down, survived 47 days at sea. The longest recorded time. He survived with the pilot and another airman. Three men afloat of a life draft. On the very first night, one of the men panicked and ate all the emergency rations on the first night. Which is never a good idea when you're going to be adrift at sea for 47 days. And he tells this story of hope. Unfortunately, one of those three men did not survive. And it wasn't Louis or the pilot, but it was the man who snuck and ate all the food. Despite what he ate, it didn't keep him alive. Louis has this quote. His picture is up here on the screen. He says, where there's still life, there's still hope. What happens is up to God. The book begins with him getting shot at by a Japanese zero and diving overboard and fending off sharks. And it's just this crazy story of survival. In fact, maybe you've heard of the special forces rules of three, that you can survive 30 days without food, you can survive three weeks without water, three, uh, three uh, hours of exposure before you succumb to hypothermia, three minutes without air if you're underwater, but you can't survive three seconds without hope because once you have that, it's gone. That third man in the life raft gave up hope, and he didn't make it. He didn't survive. That's how important hope is, and it's a battle of the mind, not a battle of the bulge, the stomach. Hope is not based on what you can see on the outside or what you feel on the inside, because those things are subject to change. Your circumstances will change. How you feel about your situation or your life will change. But it's the thinking and the thoughts and what you understand about God that needs to be right and focused. And it is our source of hope. And Jeremiah here is putting the steadfast love of the Lord on the forefront of his thinking 
Ephesians 4, 23 says, and be renewed by the spirit of your mind. That's what the word of God says we should do. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We are not captive by our thoughts when we make them captive to Jesus. And here's the thing about Jesus. He doesn't share. He doesn't share your heart. He doesn't share your mind either. We often talk about idols, about being the good things that compete for the great things. But let me tell you, somebody that has seen affliction, somebody that has gone through trials and tribulations and depression and all of these different things, sometimes it's those things you fear the most that control you. And let me tell you that fear is a horrible taskmaster. You can't escape them. I've been on my face on the floor over the last few years, crying out for all sorts of things, for God's church, for, for people in my life, the hard stuff. My wife has come in and seen me on the floor. And she says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just crying out to the Lord. I need to get my headspace. I need him to take me captive. Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because they trust in you. And finally, Romans 12.2, a familiar verse. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In your time of discouragement, what are those scripture verses that have encouraged you the most? That would probably be a really fruitful use of the rest of our time here in chapel. Is just turn to the person next to you and go, hey man, this is the verse that God used in my life. Hang on to those verses and share them. There's a story of a Bible study of of people that were asked that question, and a young man said, well, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, shall not want. He leads me through the valley of the shadow of death. He never leaves me. A young woman said that God is my refuge and a strength, the very present help in time of trouble, Psalm 46.1. Another woman said, Jesus promised in this world you have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome this world, John 16. And then an older gentleman in the back, Mr. John, got up and he said 85 times in the Bible, and it came to pass. And people thought, well, this guy's a little bit crazy. He's lost the plot. And he said, no, let me tell you. In my lifetime, in my experience, at the age of 30, with five mouths to feed, I lost my job. And I didn't know where food was going to come from. Literally, ends meat wasn't being met. And God provided. At the age of 40, my son went off to war, and he didn't come back, and it knocked me down. At the age of 50, we lost our home to a fire. At the age of 60, my wife, of over 25 years, contracted cancer. And for five years, we cried out to God on our face. And she went home to be with the Lord, and I miss her every day. And I can tell you that at every juncture, at every loss, I would turn to God's word and I would find a verse there that would say, and it came to pass. Because your trials and tribulations and the hard things and the broken things and the smoldering ruins of whatever is going on in your life has a season. And seasons aren't forever. Somebody needs to hear that this morning to be encouraged. Seasons have a beginning and they have a middle and they have an end. They are not who you are. They do not label you forever. Jesus and your identity needs to be found again in him who can never be burned up or taken away. It's the steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases. And it's your second Hebrew word this morning for love is rakhem. Can you say it? Rakhem. You can impress all your friends later on with your Hebrew knowledge. It's rakhem. It's when you're on your face before the Lord and in your honest moments when it's just you and your pillow and you go, God, do you even know? Do you even care? And oftentimes God will come to me and say, you know, you know that I do. I remember crying out to the Lord recently. God, where are we at? Where are we going? Like we don't know what's next. And I don't even know if you know what I'm going through right now. And the Lord said, just look to the tomb. I said, what do you want me to look at? He's like, what do you see? I said, I see nothing. And he said, that's exactly right. Because it's empty. 
Because whatever you're dealing with, I already died for and I rose again. And those things that are holding you back, I've died for and I can now give you power to rise again. You need to put your anchor in me, your trust in me. We used to live in a city called Tauranga and Ryan did his best effort to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> but in Maori, it means a safe harbor or literally a safe anchorage. In one of our last moves in New Zealand, we moved to a, a street called Vail Street. And I just remember because things were going crazy and, 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 you know, there were some hard challenges and things. Missions are like that. Church planning is like that. It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. It's Dickens' novel all over it. But I remember just driving that moving truck down Vale Street in the, the safe harbor going, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. And I'm like, surely there's got to be a verse to underwrite that, uh, that hymn. And we even sang it this morning in one of our songs. The verse is found in Hebrews 6.19. And in the New Living Testament, uh, it says this hope, or translation, it says this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the veil into God's inner sanctuary. It's that love of the Lord that never ceases. The word for that is a sympathetic pity or concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others. It's God saying, I know exactly what you feel. I've been there, and I will never leave you in that state because I know. When you start to realize that, and the Lord picks you up, one of the first things that you go is like, I don't deserve that kind of love that would die and rise again to raise me up out of my dramas and issues. And you know what God says? You're right, you don't. <laughs> but it's yours, freely given, freely received, and it's my mercy that never comes to an end. It is fresh and new every morning. How many of you are like, yes, I need that? I don't need yesterday's manna mercy. I need today's. And I need to trust that it's fresh and that it's right here and that it will never come to an end because I need a second chance. I need a third chance. I need a hundred chance. And sometimes I feel like I've blown it so greatly that God will never use me again. He will never give me another opportunity. I have blown it. Because some of the rubble and our smoldering ruins in our life, it's not just what other people have done to us. It's what we've done as well. Or some combination thereof. And we look at that and we go, I don't deserve that. But there was another man in the Bible that I can relate to by the name of Peter. And he is a man that says, mercies from the Lord, they will never come to an end. Here's the thing about mercy. Mercy. It cannot exist outside of environment of failure. And he says here that in 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. It's not static. It's not in a vacuum. It's not like, well, I was hopeful in one minute, but I stepped out of that. It is something you live and breathe and is active and alive. So what are you going to do about all of those things that are smoldering in your life? Author Bob Goff says, sometimes we ask for help and God gives us hope. Not because it's different, but because it's the same. Not because it's different, but because it's the same. I think, um, I think Jeremiah would say the same. He would say, the Lord is your portion. He says, great is your faithfulness. Come to the Lord and let him peep onto your plate the portion of new mercy and steadfast love that you need for that day. I only have one thing left from that fire, and it's a plate. The actual plate's on a container ship leaving Sydney at some point. We don't know quite yet, but it's the only thing I have from the fire. And it's the only thing that survived the fire. As we sifted through the ashes of what was left of our home, in our lives, the only things that we realized were worth saving were things that had already been through the fire. The only things that survive fire are the things that have been through fire, like the kiln that this plate would have gone through. Henry Ironside, one of my favorite American preachers, gives a story of people traveling across the American West. They were going across the plains and there was a fire coming towards them. A scout came and said, we cannot outrun this fire. And so the men got together and 
they developed a plan. They said, we are going to light a fire behind us and let the wind blow it away, and we will walk on the charred ground after this fire. And so that's what they began to do. And all the families gathered, and one dad was walking across the charred grounds that they had just backburned, which if you're familiar with that term, that's exactly what they did. And their, his daughter ran up to him and grabbed his hand and goes, Daddy, I'm afraid. Why are we lighting more fire? And he says, understand this, honey. Fire can't go where fire's already been. You see, the all-consuming wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ for you and I. So that whatever we're facing in this world, the sin and the heartache and the, the consumingness has all been placed upon Jesus. And he's risen again for you. So I want to respond now and pray and give you that opportunity. If you want hope here this morning, steadfast love, never-ending mercy, I just want to invite you to stand with me right now, exactly where you're at. Just stand. Go for it. Right now, don't wait. I've run out of time, so there's no, like, massive call. But I want to pray this verse for you. If you're seated around somebody that's standing, would you stand and just put your hand on the person's shoulder in front of you, to the side of you? I want to pray my daughter Hope's life verse. She's six. She doesn't get to pick her own life verse, so I picked this for her. (laughs) And I want to pray it for you guys and send you out into your week. It's Romans uh, 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you hear us, that you know us intimately, that you've died for us and that you now live for us. God, as we go out there, Lord, I pray that we would walk in the steadfast love and the never-ending mercy that you provide and that we would be agents of hope in a hopeless world that is looking for the real thing, that they would find it in the God of all hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys.